Throughout our history, we have brought pieces of the unknown into our home as a reminder of what we experienced. Our future, however, will require us to bring pieces of our home out into the unknown with us. So today we will be continuing our look at interstellar colonization and generation ships with a look at how you go about moving whole ecosystems to be transplanted to alien worlds. The first and most key thing to understand is that this inevitably requires a certain amount of compression and loss, a lot like compressing an image by zipping it. Short of moving an entire planet, which is actually possible, to another system with a planet perfectly matching Earth, which is also possible, you will never end up with an exact copy of an ecosystem. After all, such a place is not just the flora and fauna in it, it's the terrain inside it too, the microorganisms there, and its interaction at the edges with its neighboring ecosystems. Even minor changes in terrain, weather, and sunlight can change the dynamics of an ecosystem, as can changes to its neighbors, and of course it is worth remembering that these changes are always going on naturally. There are no perfectly balanced ecosystems, they are dynamic, evolving, and ever-changing. So our threshold of good enough is actually how nature rolls anyway. This would vary with the folks making that decision, but recreating Earth in minute detail isn't really the goal of interstellar colonization. We want similarities, but not perfect copies complete with the same mountains and rivers, that would be boring. As we look at this today though, we are going to be shooting for the most complete ecosystem we can get, even though odds are many colonies would opt not to go that route. We are showing it can be done rather completely, not that you necessarily would. We should also note that there is no such thing as a closed ecosystem, even our entire planet, if thought of as such, still relies on the sun and moon in major ways, for light, warmth, tides, and so on. Even our biosphere is just a thin skin along the surface, with constant interaction not just above to the heavens, but also down deep as we exchange a lot of material with our planet's crust and mantle. They are all external inputs, so a smaller ecosystem engineered to be fairly stable shouldn't be thought of as not being closed just because it might need the occasional infusion of new DNA. After all, it needs light and energy from outside too. A complete ecosystem need not take up a lot of space either, and I don't mean because DNA is so small you could fit copies of every species on the planet in the palm of your hand, or even digitally store them. For most of our planet's history, there has been life, but just single-celled life or very basic multicellular types. These tend not to be too dependent on each other, and you can fit millions of members of millions of species in such a volume. Indeed you already have complete ecosystems in the palm of your hand, or at least under your fingernails, and scientists found something like 1500 new species just by examining our belly buttons, and several dozen on Mir and the ISS. You have more unique species in your body than there are species of birds and beasts, and for most of our planet's history you could have gotten a solid and representative sample of our planet's ecology by just filling a modest box with petri dishes scraped from random spots in, down, and around our oceans. The other thing of course is that we can up that diversity for a colony immensely by storing samples, both of entire species we don't need yet and members of species left back on Earth. You'd have problems finding room on a ship for 2,000 elephants to provide a stable genetic pool, but you don't need to, you can just transplant a fertilized embryo from an unrelated elephant into its future mother. However, and this will be important for our next episode too, for some species you still need a viable population for social purposes. Humans are not the only species that pass behavior on that is learned, not instinctive. For some species those behaviors might be relearned with a few generations with zoologists directly involved, but for others it might not be plausible at all. Indeed for humans, or modern human civilization anyway, it might be that your minimum size for that social continuity is actually much larger than that needed to avoid genetic bottlenecking, or making the gene pool so shallow that the only option is inbreeding, with disastrous consequences. 
On top of that though, you'd have some species, like the prairie dog, that not only creates its own living area, but changes the entire ecology and provides living area, food, and habitation for many species that couldn't survive without it. In ecology, this is a keystone species for an ecosystem, and you probably need to have it even though it might not need much social continuity. They might not need many members, but some other species that need social continuity and eats them might require you to have a lot of them. So this is one approach, you figure out which species need that social continuity, and the minimum population they need for this, and you build your colony ship habitats with that in mind. Whichever of those needs the most space for a viable ecosystem represents your ship size. As we discussed last time in Exodus Fleet, a colony expedition to a new solar system is likely to be a colonial fleet, not a lone colony ship. So if you find out that elephants need 10,000 square kilometers for a complete elephant pack, that's your minimum ship size. Other ships can be smaller or more likely just contain several ecosystems, overlapping or segregated off. Such a ship, as a classic rotating habitat, might be 20 kilometers across and 150 kilometers long. That is a pretty big ship, and far more than most will need, so we'd like to shrink that and we'll discuss some approaches in a moment. A couple of notes however, that may be a big ship, but it is buildable, and on century long missions it is nice to have lots of elbow room for your human population. As we discussed last time, the size of these ships isn't actually all bottleneck on colonization. Even for ships this big, there is more than enough raw material in our solar system to construct whole fleets of such vessels to send off to every star near enough to us that we want to colonize them directly without even putting a scratch in our solar system's resources. We will also see how this sort of path pushes you more toward the gardener ship variation of the generation ship we've discussed before, that stops at plants temporarily to restock raw materials and set up a colony, then moves on, rather than staying there forever, as it would seem to make more sense to have your pachyderm ship move on to the next plant to colonize, rather than retask or scrap it. Ultimately though, smaller is better when you can do it, so how do we go smaller? We have several approaches, one of these is the pygmy route which involves breeding up some smaller elephants with the same brain and behavior, then reverse the process on arrival, speeding up by using implanted embryos on the larger side of what's safe for each successive pack to rear. You might need to go rather slow with something like elephants of course, since size is a pretty big part of their social dynamic along with age, and they live a long time. If the bigger and older elephants are having to deal with younger ones who are already much bigger than them, it might screw up the social dynamics and render the entire process pointless. A human can raise an elephant after all, or a pack of them, the idea is that we can't do it as well. That's our second approach by the way using humans or robots or virtual reality to cut down on needed space or resources. This is part of the stow and grow approach we see with seed ships or data ships. You pack everything tight as essentially data, DNA or digital, and grow it on arrival. Taken far enough, you don't even need elephants alive for the trip, you just clone them on arrival and let them get raised by an artificial intelligence, either in a virtual reality or in an elephant mimicking robot. We talk about uploading human minds a lot on this channel, and there's no reason you couldn't upload an elephant mind either. For that matter, while a zoologist can raise an elephant and not do as good a job as an elephant, presumably, one can also presumably get better at that with more technology and research into such methods and the social structure of the species in question. Don't take that as easy though, your animal mimicking robots have to be very good and we'd have to design an equivalent of the Turing test for every single species we needed to do this with. Many would be simpler than tricky a human mind with an android, but would still need to incorporate everything from behavior to appearance and smell. In theory, we could establish entire ecosystems in a digital substrate for the duration of a voyage, with Dumbo and all his friends blissfully unaware that they are in a simulation. One morning, they wake up a little dazed and groggy on the real terraformed alien world or space habitat at the destination, completely unaware that they have just woken up from being vat grown and their digital minds downloaded into the flesh and blood brains. Done right, 
they get up and go on their merry way, doing whatever elephants do, in the same way they did yesterday when they were digital simulations. If you want to skip all those routes, you can just supplement the diet of those elephants. A pack needs thousands of square kilometers of land because they need to eat, and tend to inhabit places that are a lot less effective at producing food than a high-tech farm. A typical African elephant eats about 70,000 calories a day, but they're pretty flexible about where that comes from, unlike something like a panda, so you can compress their natural habitat quite a bit by growing food elsewhere in dense and efficient hydroponics and having robots drag it in, or have them simply apply a lot of farmer techniques to enhance biomass production inside that habitat. If you know what you're doing, to avoid screwing with their behavior or health while supplementing their diet, you can get away with a much smaller habitat. We are focusing on elephants because they are probably the most space demanding. The general consensus of zoologists I've seen is that while the minimum for health is about a hectare, a few dozen productive hectares apiece is probably the goal for elephant packs, though more is always better. We will say 50 hectares apiece and a pack of 50 elephants, or 2500 hectares or 25 square kilometers. That's probably overkill, but the less dense they are, the easier it is to include other species they are to share in the environment. That would be a rotating habitat 2 kilometers in diameter and 4 long, more in keeping with the ship sizes we discussed before for generation ships. Now you need nothing like this for most species, even most animals. There's around 5,000 mammal species, and most are a lot smaller than people, let alone elephants. Most of those do not really need the continuity of society to do okay either, and even of those, most could be guided up by zoologists. They might be a bit weird for a few generations, then return to normal, or a new normal. Keep in mind, an elephant growing up under an alien sky, or one growing up in a cylinder habitat where the sky is more pasture, is not going to be quite identical in behavior. That's not necessarily a bad thing either, the elephants in India are not the same as the ones in Africa, in behavior or genetics, so they need not be the same around Alpha Centauri either. When you're building these ships, you are aiming for the smallest size you can, based on your knowledge and technology and the species in question, and the biggest you can depending on your budget and desire, and will settle for a happy medium. You are not building a zoo and you are not building a natural habitat, you're building a colony fleet to make a colony. You can worry about replicating things like back home and maximizing the welfare of those critters once you get there. The passengers are not meant to be a complete and final system. Now on something like a gardener ship or gardener fleet, you do need that, because you might be doing it for millions of years, but then that's another reason I suspect that will be the preferred approach to colonizing other solar systems. If you have a bunch of people tasked to make new worlds, trained to care about that as their main purpose in life, and to tend to their fellow non-human passengers, and with those passengers living in their literal backyard, you are going to have a rough time with crew morale if they feel like their charges are being neglected or abused. I don't think we want to discourage them in that either, or teach them to be callous or distant, we are, after all, principally focused on seeding human civilizations around the galaxy, and we'd probably prefer that not be done by heartless jerks. Now we picked elephants because they are huge, space demanding even for their size, and very social. While they are probably the most demanding for land species, they aren't the only challenge we face. We have smaller apex predators that need a lot of land to support hordes of the critters they eat, for instance, and it might be rather bizarre to have hordes of robot antelope with lab-grown meat on them running around. You can still compress that space though by enhancing the food source for those herbivores and letting the predators more often find random vat-grown carcasses to scavenge. It summons an image of the park from Westworld to mind, but with the robots being animals rather than people, and with a lot of zoologists wandering around. We always think of the crews of spaceships having a lot of engineers and physical scientists, but colony ships probably would have way more biologists, botanists, and zoologists. But of course you'd need marine biologists too, because we have a lot of oceanic life, some of those are pretty big and complex. A shark is a pretty simple critter, they are mostly instinctual, and they don't raise their young. However a few types are actually very social, 
with each other anyway. To everything else in nature, they really are giant killing machines, and we probably could skip them on a ship entirely in favor of growing them at the destination from frozen stock. Needless to say, whales and dolphins are also very social and do need that social continuity and a lot of space, or rather water. Water is heavy too. It may not be as heavy as dirt, which tends to be about twice as dense, but it's a thousand times denser than air. As we discussed in the Ocean Planets and Water Worlds episode, most life in the oceans is pretty close to the surface and the various pelagic zones, areas broken up by depth and sunlight, don't have all that much crossover especially with the very deep parts of the bathpelagic or abyssopelagic. Except for nutrients of course, those lower depths are just as dependent on organic material falling from the upper regions, marine snow, as those regions are on sunlight falling on them. The marine snow that feeds the deeper zones can be replicated by just dumping organic material from hydroponic facilities into such environments, but some critters do cross zones a lot, and whales for instance are a good example of that. Kuvo's beaked whale can dive 3 kilometers, near the bottom of the bath pelagic. That is a lot of water and a lot of depth too, which is very rough on rotating habitat holes. We have a couple of advantages though. First, you do control the gravity in a habitat. It varies linearly with the distance from the center, and halfway from the middle the gravity is half what it is at the edge. We can also spin it slower or faster and the shape of the rotating habitat is not restricted to cylinders. Second, we don't know how dependent any species is on gravity, less might be fine, and those living in an aquatic environment in particular might not need much gravity so you could possibly get away with very low spin rates and gravity on them. Third, those zones get increasingly lower in biomass density as you go deeper and all the light goes away as the pressure rises too. The entire bathypelagic zone, everything below a kilometer of depth, is essentially a scavenger zone and even the mesopelagic, everything under 200 meters, is pretty sparse compared to the epipelagic surface layer. This would seem to indicate that you mostly don't need to replicate anything much more than 200 meters in radius for that habitat, but you can do your lighting differently, lighting lower depths to make the epipelagic in spots, and leaving other spots unlit to handle the light from the lower pelagic zones. We've discussed these before as vertical reefs, and we will look at them more in Colonizing the Oceans next month. One upside is that while dolphins and whales are probably as space intensive as elephants, they also do well with humans, so we can get away with smaller groups that marine zoologists help along. They are a problem though, and water is a problem on spaceships, it sloshes about in response to changes in acceleration and spin gravity. That's fun in your bathtub, but a tsunami in an O'Neill cylinder is somewhat more terrifying. While you are cruising through space with your cylinders rotating, all is well enough, but if you are accelerating or decelerating up or down from your cruising speed, all your water wants to go spilling toward your ship's drive. Now, this isn't too big a problem if you are accelerating slowly. If your maximum ship speed is about 10% of light speed, probably about the best you can get from fusion, then at 1G of acceleration you will only need about a month to hit that speed and if your destination is 10 light years away, that will be a journey of 100 years with a month of acceleration and deceleration on each end. No big deal. If you wanted to do that though, you will have to wait until you're up to cruising speed to set up all your habitats and deal with some problems during switchover, as you throttle down the drive and spin up the drum. You've got to do that again at the other end, and you have to do all your setup with your crew which admittedly gives them something to do during an otherwise boring mission. But more realistically, you will want to start that habitat long before your colonists ever board the ship, probably spending decades in a shipyard essentially being terraformed alongside fleets of sister ships bound for that system or others. And you'll want to keep that ship when you arrive too. Terraforming planets isn't a fast process, and it's very destructive, so you want to live in your ship in orbit during the early violent phases. All of this means you want a slow acceleration while the habitat drum is spinning. You might even make it ever so slightly conical, rather than cylindrical, so that the net gravity will be perpendicular to the floor, ideally a semi-flexible floor that can be released when the drive shuts off so it returns to a cylinder shape. 
In a spinning cone, gravity is zero at the tip and highest at the base, and by using a conic section, one just a little narrower at the back near the drive, you can eliminate some of the material migration. When the drive is off, if it can't expand back to that cylinder shape, you just have slightly lower gravity in those areas, and not a lot. If you were doing 10% of a G for your thrust, you'd take a year to get up to 10% of light speed, and a year down, a pretty small time delay for a century long voyage, that would still be quite a pain, but may be preferable to the delay of a mere hundredth of a G, which could practically be ignored, but would add a decade to both the start and end of your journey. I suspect this would be the upper and lower bounds of how fast you'd accelerate a colony ship though, faster is hugely problematic for little gain, you're shaving off months not years to your total voyage time, slower is just rather pointless, you'd need fairly good measuring equipment to even notice that the gravity wasn't quite pointed straight down. Just as a reminder, Earth spins too, and the centrifugal force we experience from that is not straight up anywhere but the equator, so don't think net gravity being pointed slightly off-center from spin is the kind of thing where even small quantities can cause problems. Your concern is so much of it that you get tidal waves and landslides inside your habitat drum toward the back, and you can get around that even for fairly high acceleration rates by sectioning the drum up with retaining walls. You might want to do stuff like that anyway, gently sloping tiered walls which can blast open and slam a bulkhead across the whole cylinder, since a puncture could otherwise wreck a whole habitat section. I'd actually bet though that most of these would have lots of sealed off sections for individual smaller ecosystems, ones you could wholesale remove as wedges at your destination. The image of a generation ship as a single vast cylinder you can look across doesn't work too well, to avoid loose material and water slamming around under any acceleration, you want a lot of compartmentalization, which has other advantages too. You would like to conceal your compartments as hills and ravines to make it look like a single big landscape, but it would be compartmentalized. This isn't a very big problem though, even for species like elephants or whales that need a lot of space, or migrating birds, it wouldn't be that hard to have passages in between compartments they could use, just stick a little tracker in each critter that opens the airlock when they are near and a shutdown override you can trigger if that compartment is sealed off temporarily adds a lot of safety features and makes it easier to gather them somewhere when you need to. Odds are pretty good any critters you can't grow easily will have such trackers in them anyway, since those are your size bottleneck, so you can help keep the space they need minimal by monitoring them closely for problems. This is fundamentally an artificial environment, you are not letting nature take its course, and if you need to knock out a lion before it kills one of the members of your keystone species for that habitat section, it helps be able to have trackers on all of them. Ditto, if you have an otherwise valuable member of that species who has a chronic illness and needs medication every day snuck into its food or injected by a robot mosquito. This is all a lot of work obviously, and is one of the reasons why I can't imagine anyone would get bored on these trips. You can decrease it by better technology, better understanding of biology and ecology, or by just making your ships bigger, thus allowing more of those critters and more people to tend them. It's not even possible to be more than vaguely in the right general area for how big these ships need to be and how many you need at this time, and I would expect one of the jobs in the future will be whole universities worth of scientists spending generations trying to fine tune everything against various benchmarks for size, cost, mission goals, acceptable drift in ecosystem or critter behavior, and so on. Many critters are easy, but many are very hard, and may require huge numbers of experts to study all these species first and then to properly model a viable stable habitat for them. Again, something like migratory patterns can depend on everything from magnetic fields and day length by season, to wind and water flow, even fire, we have species that propagate seeds that way, and if you needed them during the trip you'd have to torch part of your habitat drum periodically. This may turn out to be complex enough that the stow and grow approach of seed and data ships ends up being technically easier. We skipped a lot of the other challenges too. Gravity and air pressure vary a lot with height inside rotating habitats, you could have problems with birds and insects and deep sea life that way. Feeding deep sea life is hard too, 
as plankton, the basis of many marine food chains, is surprisingly tricky to manage for such a simple type of organism. Ships may have many compartmentalized and separate ecosystems, but are likely to specialize in certain climates. You'll need swamps and deserts, lakes and oceans, forests, steamy jungles, and frozen tundra of every conceivable kind in between, and you'll want to keep them grouped together to share assets and expertise as much as you can, and to replicate the native environment as close as you can. Even a lot of microbes are touchy about that and don't grow well in captivity, something we didn't even notice till relatively recently. The more we know, the smaller we can go, but at the same time, we often end up finding out about problems we didn't even know about that will require extra efforts or interdependent species we didn't even realize had a connection. We might find out that you need ships even bigger than an O'Neill Cylinder and dozens of them for each colonial fleet, although with enough research I think that will be unlikely. Now you might say that's a lot of effort to go through when there's a good chance you could go the hard tech route and just clone everything on site, stow and grow, and if needed dump in copies of uploaded animal minds into them for when you arrive if instinct isn't enough. Indeed I suspect that might be a popular approach, but that requires a lot of work too, and keep in mind you will need all these skills and exports to make the habitats and terraform plants at the destination too. Moreover, you will need them to colonize our own solar system, so you should have the knowledge base already there before you begin interstellar colonization, and you will need those skills when you arrive, and your crew does need something to do during the trip, so there is a logic to doing things this way. Indeed, as mentioned previously, you probably are starting this work before the ship even leaves the solar system, which is a good way to weed out unsuitable candidates. If much of your crew is spending a year or two getting the habitat drum ready before it even gets loaded into the ship, they have time to get used to what they are doing and who they are doing it with, and can jump ship if they don't like it, rather than an interstellar space. Once a ship gets underway and up to speed, you are stuck on it for the duration, which is likely to be at least several decades and possibly thousands of years. That itself is another big issue and one we'll be addressing in our next episode of the series, The Ark of a Million Years, where we will see that maintaining a human civilization on these ships is maybe harder than even maintaining these ecologies. After all, it needs to be one that can still be useful, maintain the ships, and get the mission done on arrival, while also still being a civilization we'd actually want to transplant not one gone primitive or mutated so far off basic human behavior that it might as well be an alien colony you founded, not a human one you could get along with. We had to skip over a lot of complexities of ecosystems today, like genetic bottlenecking, and we also mentioned the idea of using robots to colonize places. There's a great computational biology course on Brilliant.org that covers these topics, including a colonizing Mars quiz where we send robots off to do it that explains a lot of the biological concepts in terms of simple robots mutating and having features added, which I have to say is probably the best explanation of genotypes and a phylogenetic tree I've ever heard. If you're like me and more of a physical sciences and computer person, it's a great approach to learning some of these biological concepts, and also a great introduction to von Neumann machines and some of the problems they face that tend to get skipped in sci-fi. If you want to learn more about those and other topics you'd need for running a generation ship, go to Brilliant.org slash Isaac Arthur and sign up for free, and also the first 200 people that go to that link will get 20% off the annual premium subscription. And I really do advise trying out that robot course, it's just plain fun. So today we focused a lot on ecosystems in interstellar missions, Next week it will be more about post-biological approaches to the future, as we examine the role of artificial intelligence and robots in warfare, in Attack of the Drones. The week after that we'll be back to interplanetary colonization in Colonizing Neptune, and we'll look at colonizing our most distant major planet, along with its close cousin Uranus, both in terms of colonizing their moons like we did for Jupiter and Saturn, but also if we can actually colonize these sorts of small and cold icy giants directly and live in their atmospheres, or even terraform them into super planets. For alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel, and if you enjoyed this episode, hit the like button and share it with others. 
Until next time, thanks for watching and have a great week.